Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I uh, welcome members of the press and public to the eighth meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2015? Uh, I'd like to first of all ask all those present to ensure that their electronic items are switched into flight mode uh, so that they do not affect the work of the committee. Uh, Colleagues, can I take you to agenda item number one? Uh, and the decision is that we take agenda item numbers five, six, and seven in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. going to move us to agenda item number two, which is major capital projects. Uh, and can I uh, welcome uh, the panel that we have before us this morning from the Scottish Government? Uh, can I firstly welcome uh, Alison Stafford, uh, Director General of Finance, uh, Sharon Fairweather, uh, Deputy Director of Finance Programme and Management, and Andrew Watson. Uh, uh, Andrew, oh, so I think we've got a slight change here. Uh, Andrew Watson, Deputy Director for Financial Strategy, and John Matheson, Director of Health Finance, eHealth and Analytics. Okay, we've got that correct now. Uh, Understand we have a, a short statement, uh, five minutes, from Alison Stafford. Good morning. Um, convener, thank you for the opportunity to discuss with the committee the government's six monthly report on major capital projects. The report is the product of some effective collaboration between the Scottish Government's Infrastructure Unit, Audit Scotland and this committee. And I hope that the committee finds the current format of the report helpful. It's perhaps worth reflecting on the steps we have taken together to consider how the government manages, monitors and reports on major capital projects. Um, the most recent report in June 2013, the Auditor General for Scotland, published the Scotland's key transport infrastructure projects, which made three main recommendations relating to improving Transport Scotland's control and decision making, developing a scrutiny of major projects by the Scottish Government, and improving openness and public accountability by the Scottish Government. Subsequent to the Audit Scotland publication and a meeting with this committee, the Permanent Secretary agreed to review the reporting arrangements for future major capital projects and those updates, and the Scottish Government and Audit Scotland officials should work with the committee clerks on a revised reporting format for future six monthly updates. So the December 2013 Major Capital Projects report provided by the Permanent Secretary included an additional section on actions taken by the Scottish Government in response to the Audit Scotland report, including a revised reporting format for future six monthly updates and the refinement by the Infrastructure Investment Board chaired by me of its framework for scrutinising, challenging and monitoring major investment projects. So we have agreed with a former shape of this committee, a revised format for that six monthly major capital projects, to now include projects over £20 million. Previously it was £50 million that we looked at. An annual update on the local economic benefits of projects and progress updates against agreed cost and time parameters for projects that have progressed beyond the outlined business stage. This has been reflected in the updates provided in March 2014, September 2014 and more recently March this year. And I am grateful for Audit Scotland's positive feedback on the steps we have taken. I believe that we now have a fit for purpose process and format for our reporting, but I am interested in your views. Turning briefly to the contents of the latest six monthly report, the report illustrates the good progress that is being made across our investment programme with a wide range of significant projects at an advanced stage. Infrastructure investment remains a key part of the government's economic strategy and through the Infrastructure Investment Board and our wider governance, assurance and project management arrangements, we are taking steps to ensure that projects are well managed and deliver value for money. Scotland has a strong reputation in terms both of our ability to deliver major projects and as an attractive place in which to invest. It's important that we all do we can to maintain and enhance that reputation and I would welcome the committee's input in that context. Clearly, any answers to very detailed points on individual projects may best be addressed by the senior responsible officers of those projects. And when we have an inquiry from the committee, we always consult the project owners and to make sure that you are getting the most robust and best up-to-date information. 
and we will, if there, we continue to endeavour to get those responses to the committee. If there's anything today that requires us to go along that route, then obviously we will signal that and endeavour to come back to you very timeliously. That said, I will be happy to address any questions you might have. Uh, together with colleagues with me today, John Matheson, whose title you've already expressed, I won't repeat it again, um, Sharon Fairweather, who's currently Deputy Director for Finance Programme Management, but most recently was um, involved in the operational work of Transport Scotland as the Finance Director there, so brings live and current experience of managing individual projects there. And Andrew Watson, who in his um, role and responsibilities include looking at the inf infrastructure investment strategy. So, thank you for listening. Happy to move on. Mr Stafford, uh, I now open it to questions, and uh, firstly, of Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your opening statement. Um, can, can I just say that the transport infrastructure is uh, important throughout <coughs> Scotland, but as a MSP for the Highlands and Islands, it's an absolute lifeline, so it's not a case of five minutes off a journey. <laughs> you know, you just don't move. Uh, and I also obviously want the Highlands to be and islands to be attractive place to invest. So I will just give you the four projects that I would like some clarity on, uh, uh, seeing as I've got in first. And uh, I will remain consistent to the A9. There's nothing more important to the Highlands than the A9. Uh, now, after eight years of an SNP government with, uh, who've you know, promised to dual the complete A9, Perth to Inverness, 110 miles. It's taken eight years to get 7.5 kilometres uh, from Kincraig to Dalradi. Uh, there's still 67 miles to go. So my question is, I notice that Lunkerty to Burnham is now gone to a public inquiry and uh, there's 67 miles to be done by 2025, given that it's taken eight years to do seven, to plan to start seven kilometres in July. Is it realistic that we can dual 67 miles by 2025? My second question is the Ullapool uh, to Stornoway Ferry, absolute lifeline for the Western Isles. I travelled on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I understand that the harbour upgrades were not done uh, completed in time for the ferry and I understand that during the busiest month of the year in July that no cars will be able to cross on that ferry due to poor planning. Uh, my third question is uh, HMP uh, prison for uh, the Highlands. Now in 2009 the government announced 40 million in a new prison for the Highlands but in 2015 uh, and your update says that there's a feasibility study on a potential site. So I think people are just getting a wee bit uh, impatient about the smallest, most overcrowded prison uh, in Scotland. And my final question is um, on Inverness College, and I visited it recently, an excellent facility, uh, and well done on that. But what I would like clarity about as a, an ex-lecturer at the college, uh, how does the sale of the two existing sites at Mid Mills and Longman, which are obviously worth a significant amount of money, all we get in the reports are how much it costs, but uh, you know, does the sale of the sites... I, I would just like clarity about how much money from the sale of the sites is taken into account to fund the new building, how this works with the uh, NPD. And that's all my questions, convener. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite Sharon Fairweather to deal with the transport questions first. Um, with regards to your question on the A9, we have a, a detailed programme for delivery of the A9. It will be delivered in stages, and that programme is still on track for completion by 2025, um, but stages will come on stream between the completion of the first stage, which you've already mentioned, and 2025. Um, the, the project, as, as you're, you'll be well aware, is a very complex engineering project, and there are a whole range of processes that need to go through before you can get to the stage of going out to the procurement for any individual section. So just to kind of give you a flavour of that, throughout the whole duelling, the bodies that need to be negotiated with in order to take that duelling forward, we have the Cairngorms National Park, 
three national scenic areas, 14 scheduled monuments, one historic battlefield, three historic gardens and designed landscapes, one conservation area, 51 listed buildings, seven special areas of conservation, two special protection areas, 12 sites of special scientific interest, two national nature reserves, 142 sites registered on the ancient woodland inventory and 222 watercourses. So I'm, I'm just trying to explain the complexity of the work that needs to be undertaken in order to enable the, the design work and then the public consultation and the statutory processes to be undertaken. And as you've already mentioned, one section may be going to an inquiry because of the objections that have been received to the scheme. We have an obligation to undertake all of those statutory processes um, in a professional way, allowing the public and um, affected landowners, etc., to have um, the opportunity to object before you can take forward the process of procuring the land to then take forward the process of procurement of taking forward the scheme. So it is a hugely complex scheme to design and take forward. And that is why the timetable is that the overall scheme will take till 2025 to complete. But we will be taking forward sections as soon as we can, as soon as we have completed all of those processes. Well, my question was, it's taken eight years to plan to start seven and a half kilometres in July this year. Will the A9 from Perth to Inverness, the full 110 miles, the remaining 67 miles of dual carriageway, be completed by 2025. That is certainly the plan at this point in time, yes. Okay. For further other questions, uh, Mary Scanlon. Reason. With regard to the, the question on the, on the ferries, um, if you don't mind, I will ask that we get a more up-to-date position from the ferries team about that. I'm aware that there are... Um, concerns around the uh, ferry in July not being able to take cars, but I do know that alternative routes have been planned for that car traffic during that period of time. Um, but I would rather get an up-to-date information from you from the ferries team on the exact dates for when things will be moving forward on that. I don't have that information to hand, I'm afraid. But he'll follow that up and, and make sure we get response in writing for that. Uh, can we deal with other... In terms of HMP Highlands, so I'd like to ask Andrew Watson to pick this one up, please. Um, as members will be aware, um, the, the issue uh, that has been was challenging around the prison has been identifying um, an appropriate site for the development, given the, um, the size of the area covered by the prison. Um, there's a, a strong preference to ensure that the site is well connected in terms of the transport infrastructure that supports the the, uh, the, the, the site. So a, a number of options have been considered, um, but as yet um, a site has not been um, uh, agreed. As you say, um, uh, there has been good progress made recently with uh, the option of a potential site um, having uh, uh, appeared, um, and uh, discussions are ongoing with the landowner in respect of, of that. Um, so progress is being made, and we'd obviously want to update the committee as soon as we could on, uh, on progress with that. Progress had been made. I said that after six years we've got a feasibility study, which is in your. I don't know if that's progress. Uh, but that's all I've got. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, so it was Inverness College. Inverness College. Inverness College yeah. is the last point. Um, the sale of the site. Yes. So in terms of the sale of the sites, obviously the Inverness College itself is an MPD. Um, that will be worked through in terms of how we um, ensure that is then financed by future revenue payments. Um, for satisfying that contract for the delivery of that particular facility, great as it is. Um, in terms of the sale of existing sites, um, we'll get the specific information back to you, but we do, as part of managing our overall capital programme, where there are assets that are owned by public bodies or by the Scottish Government or its agencies at any particular point, when we do actually look to recycle receipts that come from disposal of unused, unrequired land for particular purposes back into the capital programme. But the very specifics about the sale of the two sites that you've mentioned, we'll make sure we get the latest information and come back to you on that. So we, sorry, just finally, convener. when you say you recycle, so if the sale of the sites came to more than the cost of the college, would, would the sale of the sites go towards the building of the college and the remainder be recycled elsewhere? Is that what you mean by recycle? Um, capital receipts that come from sites uh -huh. um, can be used on a one-off basis to invest in capital somewhere in Scotland. Uh, the commitments being made around the Inverness College is an MPD and therefore the financing of that is actually to make sure that in future years 
the revenue that's required to pay for that contract is made available. So, so there is a, a particular funding stream that will ensure that the college has been paid for over the life and time of the contract of the MPD. Um, that has been a commitment that's been made by the Scottish Government. If there are sites that are part of public ownership that will give us one-off receipts when they're made available, that gets factored into the overall capital programme going forward. Come on, BT. Thank you, Mayor. Morning. Morning. Um, I've got just a couple of questions. and The, the first one uh, relates to schools, and I have a particular interest in this because on page 16 you've got New Battle High School. Now, you're showing New Battle High School that uh, construction starts 23rd of March. Um, I'm aware, and I'm hoping for a clarification from you, that there have been some delays on schools as a result of the need to comply with some new e EU regulations. Perhaps you can give us a bit more information on that and advise <coughs> what sort of delays we're talking about. Okay, um, if I pick up the, the general issue in relation to the EU regulations and the impact that it's having on schools, um, the information really stands as uh, in line with the IPQ that was actually set out to Parliament on the 13th of February by the Deputy First Minister. So we are still waiting for the process of um, review by the Office of National Statistics to be completed. Um, that review is based on one particular project, and that's the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Um, but it is the first opportunity since the new rules have come in from Europe to actually test um, the appropriateness of the contract structures that we have in place. So. Um, what has happened is that in relation to the schools, um, we are trying to work through, through SFT, with the individual projects required to be as far as advanced as they can be, so that as soon as we actually have the information from the ONS, we're in a position to be able to sort of keep the progress moving on those things. Um, the ONS have said that this process can take several months. Um, the reason Haven't they had several months? Um, there's, they are still working on it. Um, so it's because they actually have a whole range of inches and inches of detailed documents that are the legal documents around AWPR. They also have the actual ESA 10 position from Europe. But equally so, there is um, guidance that is continuing to evolve around the interpretation of ESA 10. And so it is still um, a movable feast. Um, we keep in touch, obviously, as you would expect, regularly with ONS. We make sure that if there's any information that they still require to help them with their analysis. But we are still expecting it to take a bit longer and a few more months yet before we actually get a conclusion from them and a resolution on this. So are we correct to say that uh, any work on schools is at a halt at this point in terms of uh, potential starting construction of that, giving contracts? That's all on hold for the moment. Um, Across the board. I mean, what's happening through SFT is that anything that can be done to make sure <coughs> everything that can be ready so that as soon as the information is clear and the position is clear is being done. So um, I, I would actually still be encouraging local projects, local teams to still be looking to see are there other things that they can be addressing so that actually we can be as far advanced as we possibly can for when we have that clear position and are able to move forward. So you can do everything up to the point of completing the contract and actually starting the work? Yes. And we don't actually know when we'll be able to to start? That's that's fair, yes, that's the position we're in. How many schools are affected? All, all the schools that, are, that have not actually started construction? Um, there are eight schools which were identified <coughs> when the IPQ was put to Parliament. There are eight schools that were actually um, on that list of ones that were going to be in the next phase of activity that are the ones that are more immediately affected by this. Right. Can you, it might be useful to get that list of schools for the interest of the members. 
Yes, of course. Yeah. <coughs> the brief supplementary, and then I'll bring in Tavish Scott. On this very specific point, I'm sorry, I don't understand it, and I'm sure you don't really want to explain it because it sounds as though it must be complicated. But uh, are we looking at a position where once the ONS has actually given you a view, that's it? Or um, are we, as I would always suspect, in a position where courts might disagree with somebody? And um, you might actually finish up with a very long process before you're sure what the position is. Uh, I think because this actually is one of the first contracts that ONS have actually looked at since ESA 10 has been issued, and more importantly, the more recent um, interpretation guidance, then um, obviously ONS will want to be doing both a thorough job and as quickly as possible. But there is, uh, there is every possibility that they may wish to go to Eurostat themselves to um, get further clarification. And as I say, this is because the guidance is very new, it's evolving, and also Europe are not only taking into account the analysis that's being done on projects in Scotland, but also actually projects and the design of them across the whole of Europe as well. So um, it is, as you said in your first comment, it's a complex landscape um, with tremendous amount of detailed paperwork, but further interpretation of it as well. But is there a risk that these delays just become interminable simply because you feel you're paralysed for, for understandable legal reasons? I mean, you know, um, it, obviously, or, we, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I mean, as chair of the Infrastructure Investment Board, the whole thing has actually been about keeping the momentum around these yeah. areas. So um, <coughs> there are risks there, as you identify. We're doing absolutely everything we can to mitigate those just to be able to keep the the traction and the activity around this. Um, but it is this collision of having a long-term programme of investment, obviously that has, as we've already rehearsed on a number of cases, long lead times for the necessary reasons to get everything in place and how that actually sits alongside movable um, parameters that are coming through from Europe who are driven by different things and obviously are also looking at how this plays for countries that use the euro as their currency as well. Okay. Okay. Wants to come back in for 30 seconds yeah, and then I just, wanted, I just wanted to ask for a reassurance that this delay uh, is not going to affect either public or private funding of these projects and that uh, you know the, the, the funding is earmarked because I wouldn't like to see these projects put at risk simply because we're sitting here waiting for a legal clarification. So um, the role of SFT in relation to all of those projects is actually to be liaising actively between the consortia of funders, the design, the builders, the people who are likely to be the contractors in supplying this, and equally important, um, the local authorities and the local communities that have a very real interest in seeing these particular projects happen. So um, just really to, to restate, we are actively managing all the risks we possibly can and we will be continuing to make representations to get speedy resolutions because of all the points that you raise. Are you comfortable yourself that uh, funding will remain in place? Um, I think we have a, a good track record of relationships with the different people who come together in these consortia. Um, obviously we've got the established landscape of hubcos and the architecture around that. So um, I don't see that being at risk, um, but we will continue to actively manage it. We wouldn't want to be complacent around those things. Scott. Thank you. I just continue the same line of questioning. Firstly, in the last question you've just been asked by Colin Beattie, um, the North Hub calls uh, private sector partners changed in the last, since this hiatus started. So I would be very hesitant to suggest there's no risk to that when already in one hub call there's been change of private sector partner, hasn't there? So um, I think what I was saying to, to Mr Beatty was actually that there are risks to manage and that's the whole reason why we have SFT that's active in this space. Um, I can bring in, if it's helpful, John Matheson, who's actually on um, the oversight board for Hub and Hub Co., and just to be able to say a little bit more about how we're getting the governance and the assurance around the sorts of things that you raise. So, John. Just to stay with the, the, the North the arrangement, there are five arrangements in Scotland, but just to focus on the North one, you're absolutely right. The, the, the partner has, say, has changed, but that was unconnected to this ESA 10 issue. That was uh, totally unrelated. 
I think as, as, as a result of that change, some of the projects that were in the pipeline have now been expedited and Forest has now concluded, Tain is now uh, open, and uh, I think we've got a good, uh, rich pipeline in terms of uh, the hub core. The governance around it is, uh, is very important, and that's the point you're, you're, you're touching on. So we have the Territory Partnering Board, we have all the local authorities within that area, uh, health boards within that area, police, fire, and uh, the, the ambulance service are all part of that uh, Territory Partnering Board. Interesting is the risk because if a private sector partner changes uh, and this hiatus, which has already lasted seven months in September of last year, it's not your fault, it's, it's coming out of ONS, it's lasted seven months already. What's to say, as Colin Beattie has alluded, that a new private sector partner is going to stay with this programme when there is no certainty on the timescale as to when they'll actually be allowed to get on with these schools that are now being delayed and have been delayed? There's no financial clause on the Anderson High School in Lerwick, as you well know. I, I do well know, and that's absolutely right. Um, in terms of managing the risk, I think the one thing I would say is that um, we are not alone. A lot of these private sector partners are involved in these sorts of uh, mixed economy financing arrangements, actually not just in this country, but actually across Europe. Um, also, we have had partnerships that have involved the European Investment Bank. So, and we have a very active pipeline where the EIB are involved. So. I appreciate that, but just in terms of the general picture around this, because this is something that, you know, number one, we have been very transparent about. Secondly, it's something that is actually a, a point of consideration and further clarification and evolution of guidance across Europe. Um, this is something that obviously then is something that is affecting these, these businesses um, on a much broader span. We are obviously in the vanguard. We're in the vanguard with AWPR and we're in the <coughs> vanguard with a lot of projects. Um, we are still able to offer these investors good, well-run projects at good, sensible rates um, and assured safeguards of funding as we go forward. So I'm not seeing anything that's diminishing that confidence, but you're right, we should remain vigilant and we absolutely will do to make sure that we keep our communications up with these various parties, that we will keep the a right amount of pressure on ONS who need the time to do the work, but actually to get a timely response so that we can mitigate these risks and actually keep them still in at least in a manageable space. When you say the uh, guidance is evolving, do you mean on a weekly basis? Or a monthly basis? Or what does evolving mean in, in practical terms? Sorry. In practical terms, so um, there was some guidance that was put out about interpretation in the back end of 2013 before ESA 10 was ever implemented in yeah. September 2014. Between then and actually another set of guidance that, which came out in August 2014, it had changed. So even though ESA 10, and the clue is in the number, and it was 2010 when the actual um, arrangements were defined, it took some time between 2010 and the autumn of 2013 to even put any guidance out about how it should be interpreted. In the months between then and August 2014, it changed again. Yeah. Um, and because there are more people now actually starting to use this, raise questions and actually test it with real life examples, and that is now obviously a more active space, then it, that's why I use the phrase evolving. The rhythm and the intervals at which we can expect things around that is not defined. Yeah, so it could go on forever. Well, um, I mean, I know it's not forever, but it feels like it to me. It feels like it to uh, constituency members like us trying to get a school built in our constituencies. So yeah. I can only restate what I've said. I know, we, we remain that. vigilant. Yeah. Um, we obviously all have the same shared yeah. endeavour. I agree. Can I ask you a better question, Alison? Um, your point, which is a very fair one about AWPR, have you taken legal advice? Has the government taken legal advice about whether you judge the, any ruling on AWPR to genuinely directly affect all the other projects in the pipeline? Um, so, just in terms of AWPR and the advice that has been taken, Sharon, you just ask you not to use documents, just to Sorry, so the Aberdeen, Aberdeen Western, Western Peripheral Route. I apologise, the old transport bit of me is coming out there, I apologise. Just for the records. Yeah. We'll both make sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we've taken considerable advice on the, um, really on the financial side around our assessment of the classification of, of Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Um, and we have taken some legal advice, I believe, around whether 
Eurostat and the ONS, how the ONS decision fits and where that fits with, with Westminster and, and, and other bodies around how we apply, apply this. I think, I, I'm not sure that we're completely clear as the legal basis of Eurostat, but it's ONS make the decision as to how the government have to apply the accounting of, of these um, projects. So would it be a ridiculous suggestion to say, uh, and to suggest for that matter, that um, the schools programme could continue? Uh, what is the potential risk of the government continuing with that, reaching financial calls on the schools that Colin Beattie and I have been describing, or the all eight schools, uh, on the basis that you don't know whether the ruling on AWPR is going to directly affect the, the rest of this programme? In other words, could you get on with it? Um, so the judgment around this is, um, I'm just thinking of also addressing your point around the, the legal aspects. Yeah. Um, so our statutory responsibility to Parliament, obviously, is how we account for activity. Yeah. Um, and we have an established method that requires the financial reporting manual to specify how we actually treat um, these types of contracts. That is not in question at all. So in terms of our statutory accounts, then that is uh, something where we do not need to seek legal advice. And because there is a, another school of thought that's around international financial reporting standards, and I'll try and avoid everyone's face glazing over at this point, but in terms of those um, international financial reporting standards, there is, there is a clear picture around that. So thankfully on the statutory obligations to Parliament and how we account, that is actually much more straightforward. Um, where this particular issue reads across to are the actual administrative arrangements that are determined country by country, and in this case it's the UK Treasury, mm. on how these items are budgeted for. Yeah. Mm. And it's that budgeting issue. Um, just to be, again, absolutely clear, this does not have any cash impact at all. Mm. Mm. So um, the flows of cash are not affected at all by this. So it is around the, um, the nature of how these activities are represented by the UK Treasury in the budgeting guidance. Mm. And actually, we are still to see budgeting guidance that um, takes into account um, ESA 10 in relation to these particular mm. projects for the reasons that I've already rehearsed yeah. that we are in this vanguard of okay. activity. Okay, I have just one final question. Can you give me I mean, I take all that. I think that's very fair. Um, also, you know, if it's an accounting procedure... You know, I think quite a lot of us would think um, solve it. But um, the uh, final question is just about how you're accounting to this committee. And actually, on the schools that uh, that have already been mentioned this morning, uh, there's no note to the account, no note to our to this committee in relation to, for example, page Annex A, page 18, which does mention the Anderson Hyde, that says all this. And I, I do think um, this is a very material issue for all of us. There should be a note in this report to us and to this committee about what's going on here, and that should be regularly updated. Since this did start in September, I really think it's the onus is on the Scottish Government to keep the committee up to date with that. And I'd like, therefore, to um, just have an assurance that that will happen in future in these reports. If there's any kind of major issue which is slowing down a project, we should know about it, and it should be in this, it should be in this table, because actually the way this table structure that suggests that the Anderson High School is going to start tomorrow. Well, I drove past it yesterday and it's starting tomorrow. <laughs> so this thing isn't accurate. So I'd, can I ask that you get that right in so, future? So well, we obviously want to make sure the information is accurate. Yeah. Um, just in terms of committing to future reports, including something on this, very happy to do that. And just to say that, um, as I mentioned in the answer to the earlier question, the IPQ that was put forward by the Deputy First Minister on the 13th of February is still very much the touchstone reference point on this issue. Um, and therefore, it is there, Parliament has it, but obviously we can make sure that if there's anything like this, that we continue to copy that into the Parliamentary Audit Committee as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, and good morning. Um, I have uh, two questions, uh, if I could put them both to you now. Um, like others, I have a constituency interest. My, my question about Forfer Academy is simply that I note um, that it hasn't reached financial close, but you've already started construction on an advanced works agreement, and I'm wondering if, if somebody could explain what that means to me and 
words of relatively few syllables and not too many sentences of more interest than perhaps would go, or, well so equally the second question would simply about be about the the vna in in dundee just down the road um we've heard all sorts of comments from people most of it via the press i think i'm just wondering whether you'd like to take the opportunity of explaining how that project has moved and clearly the numbers have changed significantly i think if you could give us your view on that that would be helpful please Thank you, Mr. Don. I will ask Andrew Watson to deal with the issue of Four for Academy. And also, um, obviously, the VNA is a project that's led by others, but I know Andrew has had some contact with it, so he will seek to address your questions as far as he can. Okay, thanks. Um, in terms of Four for, so the principal are in the advanced works is effectively um, the, those involved in the project taking as many steps as they can to get the site ready so that once you reach financial close in the project you can make as rapid progress as possible. So that can involve things like you know, clearing the site, um, laying down some of the um, initial bits of structure so that you are basically match fit when you get to the point of a financial close. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the V&A, um, uh, the dynamic around that project is a bit different from some of the other projects that are in scope of the of the progress report. So, Scottish Government is a is a key funder of the project, um, but isn't uh, the procuring authority or a, or a, or, a, or a project partner in, in that sense. Um, as the report notes, there has been an increase in the estimated cost for the project. Um, the council have um, put out a fair amount of information in terms of. The, um, the reasons for that, but they've clearly commissioned um, John McClelland to do a, a review of, um, uh, of the situation around, around the project. Um, and his remit, I think, covers three, three areas, you know, what the, right, the main reasons for the increase in estimated cost. Um, can further steps be taken now on the project to make sure it does stick within time and, and budget going forward? And other lessons to be learned in terms of the wider governance and monitoring of capital projects uh, in, in the area. So that's a welcome, a welcome step. I think um, what the, the, the I guess a key issue around the project is it's a pretty novel project. It's a novel design. Um, there have been um, some changes already to the specification of, of the project. Um, uh, I, I think that partly explains the fact that there weren't a large number of bidders for the contract. So when you get a limited um, uh, competition in terms of, uh, of, of, of the tender, that can have an impact on, on, on price. And I think there has been an, uh, an element of, of inflation uh, in, in, in the cost estimates uh, as well. So um, obviously Scottish Government's engaging closely with the, the Council on the project. It's a key part of um, our priorities within, within the culture sector. Um, through the Scottish Futures Trust, we're clearly working with the Council on the Growth Accelerator model dimension of the funding package for the project. And that's in the um, context of a wider look at the Dundee waterfront and indeed the wider Dundee area in relation to the prospects for a, for a GAM. Um, those discussions are going well, SFT are leading those, and we'd expect a business case to come to Scottish Government in due course on, on that part of the, of the landscape. Yeah, thank you. It's a part of the world I know quite well as being a, a resident and indeed a councillor there for quite some time. Uh, I'm just wondering, can you, can you give us some clues as to when that independent report is expected, please? Do, do we know? Um, I, I don't. I guess the council would be better placed to, to answer yeah. that question. I think when they initiated the work, they didn't set a fixed deadline on right. on the work to give Mr. McClelland the the scope to uh, take it where where he needed to take it. But with a, a you know a, a suggestion that because of the wide public interest in the project, you know it would need to be a process that, that drew to a conclusion relatively relatively quickly. So a matter of months, I guess, would be the a fair assessment. But, but the council would be better placed to advise on. Thank you. Plans. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, panel. Um, uh, just uh, a couple of questions. Just the first one is just regarding the two seamal ferries. Uh, obviously, in, in the documentation we have in front of us, it indicated that the, uh, the, the it go through the process in April and potentially into May. So I'm just uh, seeking clarification in terms of uh, where we currently are with that particular process, please. So, Sharon, if you could. I'm afraid I can't. I'm just trying to remember. Can you give me a few minutes? I'll see whether I've got information in my briefing pack and I'll come back to you and if not, we'll follow up. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and the, the second question, just it's regarding the, the ESA 10 regulations and the, the changes from last year, uh, is it possible to tell the committee actually what the genesis uh, of these changes actually has been, please? The... Um 
just to set a little bit about the context of, of ESA 10. So it is a statistical um, code um, that requires um, those countries that um, come under the Eurostrat umbrella um, to have consistency in the way that they report uh, particular information. And it's done through the statistical arm. Ultimately, it actually um, nests, if you look at the hierarchy of this, with, within the UN is where it all starts. And then there are particular um, geographic people and teams that are then authorised to take um, the shape and form of um, consistently derived transparent information that you, that's used at national and international level on the basis of statistics to be taken forward. Um, please bear in mind that is a chartered accountant giving you that explanation as opposed to the chief statistician of the government. Um, but hopefully this is a, at least a little more accessible to you, that that's you know, the, the architecture of it. Um, so that's, they, they will have the motivation to make sure, as I say, that there is information that's prepared that can be used for um, comparisons across international boundaries. So they will look equally at how gross domestic product, GDP figures, are actually derived and how those are um, constructed. And they also look to, to, to things around what's the level of debt and how that can be measured from a statistical methodology. So I think you can see then that when you sort of boil that down to where Eurostat will have an interest in this, and particularly for countries that are sharing a common currency of the euro, then the Eurostat will be motivated to make sure that there is a consistent way of actually assessing the various elements that they will take into account um, in looking at the, the economic and financial health of individual countries. So, so that's the very mega architecture, very high-level architecture of this. Um, if you think about what's been happening then globally around um, strength of currencies, exposure to debt, what's been happening with banking industries and the extent to which risks have been managed around that, then I think you can see why there will be further emphasis that comes through from you, both the UN and then to Eurostat as to how they want to ensure that there is still a consistent and a defined way as to how all these various um, elements are measured and communicated. Um, and I think some of the motivation around, therefore, within Eurostat is to make sure, again, that there are consistencies of how um, public measurement of certain parameters and private measurement of parameters are defined and to um, try and mitigate any criticism um, of countries across the Eurozone of actually putting certain things under different headings um, so as to either show a different position of the financial health and wealth of those individual countries. So um, that's probably the most accessible way that I could describe to you why I think some of the, the motivations are around this. Um, the ESA 10 actually has origins with UN-defined requirements that actually predate that. So there was a, still a delay between what the UN said they wanted to have happen before it was captured into a 2010 ESA, before that's obviously then now been implemented and required to be put in place across Europe from September 2014. So there is a huge long pipeline of activity that's around this. Um, the Treasury used this particular um, benchmark to consider how budgeting should take place. That's their choice. That's a local administrative choice within any country, how they choose to budget a particular thing. Um, but those are the, that's, you know, that's the actual background to all of this. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's very helpful because certainly with your comments that, uh, that you came up with earlier on, um, I mean, much of it was very high level um, as well. And uh, I think what you've just said there actually provides that further context in terms of uh, the discussion we've had this morning, particularly regarding uh, the schools uh, that my mm -hmm. colleagues uh, touched upon. So in terms of what you've said, I mean, obviously this is a, it's a, it's a wider, it's an EU uh, change, an EU set of regulations, uh, and are you aware of uh, maybe similar, circum similar events or similar circumstances happening across the EU? 
in terms of the potential delays to building projects. Now, I'm not going to ask you for individual projects, uh, but uh, I would assume that, that this may well be occurring elsewhere as well. We are aware that there's active dialogue with other countries about um, their particular um, schemes and where they sit. Obviously, we've had a very active pipeline here in Scotland. It's been a, a, the government's choice to respond to some of the recession and the really difficult times that there's been to actually seek to stimulate the economy through infrastructure investment. Um, there will be parallels in Europe. And equally, um, there is this challenge of what's happening with the Eurostat changes, and they have their own particular um, line of sight and activity, and how that sits and sometimes feels quite contradictory with all that, that Juncker is saying about the pipeline and the drive for further investment. And therefore, there will be lots of motivations as to why people want to get these issues resolved. We have them here in Scotland, but there will equally be that across Europe, and, and Juncker himself... Um, will have a keen interest in making sure that happens. Okay, well, thank you. Well, the entry from Nigel Don. Thank you. Can I, I'm, I'm just trying to put this together. I'm just wondering: am I am I right in hearing that simple, uh, ab absolutely down at rock bottom, this is about not how much money you spend, but how much of it you put in the capital column and how much of it you put in the revenue column? And we're actually delaying projects on the basis that we're not sure where we write the numbers in the cash book afterwards. Can you just my stuff? I appreciate trying to be helpful, but can we try and keep the answers as focused as we can? And if there's any additional information you can provide to the committee, you can follow that up in writing. Um, yes. Um, the, uh, I think we should follow up in writing, but the, the, the key thing actually that's um, happening around ESA 10 is actually whether the um, projects and how they are being run is whether that is being run by um, an arrangement that is very, very much within the public sector or an arrangement that's very much in the private sector. So you get into um, what the actual governance arrangements are, what's the sharing of risk. So it's getting into those sorts of detailed analyses, and that's the particular thing that... Uh, all this is looking at. Thank okay. you. Can I just ask finally, in terms of, a, sorry, so, so, me sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, Sharon Fair. Follow up on, on the, the two ferries. The, the tenders were due in at the end of March. I haven't heard anything to indicate that that hasn't happened and that the process isn't on track. It will obviously take some time to evaluate those tenders, um, but we can follow up with a more up-to-date position for you on how that tendering process is going. If that was the question that you were asking. Please, thank you. That would be, be helpful. Um, can I just ask, finally, in terms of, I mean, from the report, it clarifies that private finance remains a significant part of the programme. I think there's 30 capital projects where private finance continues. C can you explain to us what the difference is between that model and the models that, I mean, when we mention private finance, we think of PFI, we think of PPP, or different models. So <coughs> what would the difference be in that respect? Um, private finance, um, PPPs, MPDs are all variants on the same sort of model, which is actually about having consortia that can both finance and design, build and often maintain uh, an asset when it's built. Um, so these variants that you have just um, described are all part of that same arrangement. Can I ask if I said to you then, PPP model, compared to the, these models that have been proposed here, can you confirm that the companies who are involved in the PP model compared to this model are still involved? And is there a significant difference? And I'm not asking, this is not a political question, I'm just asking for in your experience what the difference is between these projects. Um, we have found that there has been um, active <coughs> engagement with, with, the, with the new models. Um, some of that will be a factor of the nature of the models and the time was where, it, where that's happened through a recession. So people who have wanted to invest have actually found it very attractive to invest in government um, to, to, programs to be fair, though, I'm, I'm probably not. I'm not asking a question about who is engaging with it. All I'm looking at is we have PPP models that have existed for some time or previously existed Pre, let's say pre-2007 and the model that we have here what is the difference between both models? So um, the main elements is actually to do with the level of profit 
and the extent to which previously there was no um, constraints on that by the way that the contracts were competed for. Um, under the MPD model, there is a more um, upfront part of the competition and part of the procurement exercise, an explicit um, cap that's there around certain elements of profits, um, just so to actually make sure that the program is still delivered, but actually at a better value for money for the public purse. So those are the main defining factors. Would the companies who were involved in the PFI PPP models are they involved in these models yes. as well? Yes. Yeah. So there's no so the, so the effectively the same companies that were involved have continued in this model as well. They they haven't been deterred by it. others have actually come into the market as well in right. Scotland as well. So um, as I say, we have seen in the vast majority of cases <coughs> active competitions and people actually seeing it's been still a good place to invest in Scotland with this particular model as well as the ones before. Companies who have enjoyed profits prior to, to this model, and for example PFI and PPP, continue to make the same profits as a result of this model? Yes, um, there will be examples where some may have gone through a re refinancing exercise and that's an opportunity to renegotiate wherever possible. Um, but um, certainly the more constrained profit environment under the newer models has not deterred those investors that used to do business in Scotland and it has attracted new ones in. What, what would be the advantage to the government for the current model compared to the previous model? Um, just in terms of value for money. Uh, could you give me one example? Sharon, do you have one? Well, the, the basis is that uh, within the contracts, and I think we need to separate out the, the two parties that are involved, the funders, so the, the financiers, the banks, the bond providers, they will receive their return, as they always have done, and the consortium of companies that are delivering the projects, so the construction companies, the maintenance companies, and the SPVs that run the projects, they, within their bids, both previously and now, are bidding with ex an expectation of a certain degree of profit built into those bids, and that's transparent within the bid process. But previously, within PFI, if there were excess savings made on that contract or any other um, circumstances that meant that they could make more money, then the co those companies kept that excess profit um, at the SPV level, particularly in the form of dividends towards the end of the project. And what the NPD model does is that it diverts those dividends towards the end of the project into the public sector and back into the public purse. Can okay, I just ask a, I mean, pretty much a layman's question, though? Are, they still, are these co private companies still making money out of the public they still, purse? They, they yeah. still make a profit so, on the contracts that they are delivering yeah. so, within so, so they've not, the So they've not actually, whilst there might be something written into the contract that means that some money is paid back to the government, which is all very well, but these companies have not walked away and says, well, there's no money in this and somebody else no. is making money out of it? No, no, they're still making a market return on their contracts, but they, are not allowed to make, they aren't able to make excess profits out of the okay. contracts. Can I just, thank you. I just ask, uh, Mr. Stafford mentioned the explicit cap. Can you see what that explicit cap is? Um, well, that will be around the specifics of the contract. So, again, Sharon, if you could come in, because obviously you've been dealing with these contracts. So, so as I say, the, the, the contracts now, there was no equity funding within the contracts. So there was no dividend funding coming out on the basis uh -huh. of exit. So the funding that goes in is on the basis of sub-debt, bank debt, bond debt, which goes with a return rate that doesn't change throughout the life of the contract, irrespective yeah. of how the contract does. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that effectively forms, uh, is a form of cap because they will get the return on the investment based on the coupon of the investment in so the initial start. Uh, it's point. really helpful you've given this evidence. It's very helpful indeed. So the explicit cap isn't actually um, a, a cap at the beginning. It's your very fair point about the end of the contract where they can't just make, as it were, excess profits yes. by yes. literally walking away from the contract, not doing any maintenance and things like that. Yes, I mean, there the, the, the there are substantial um, clauses within the contract to ensure that they deliver the services that they're required yes. to deliver at the yes. level um, that they're required to deliver them. Um, and they take significant risk on delivering that, and they're penalised if they don't. Um, but depending on the shape of the contracts, and they do all vary between yes. projects, um, there are opportunities for them to make some additional savings, additional money uh, within the shape of the contract. So, for example, the Aberdeen contract... That ec those excess surpluses, as we would call them, yes. at this point in time, come back to the public sector yes. in the form of a reduced unitary charge. Good. Yeah, good. Thank you. It's very helpful. Yeah. Ask, and I mentioned this earlier. I don't think you get a chance to answer it in terms of clarifying an example. 
of where both models have there's been a contrast between PPP and the current model? Is there any specific project that you could point to? There were the early stage PFI PPP projects in Scotland were not under the not-for-profit distributing model. So some of the early ones, like for example the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, would be a, was a, a PFI PPP model as opposed to the not-for-profit distributing model. I think. It was. It was. The it might be helpful, convener, if we just use that as a, as an example and gave some some figures back to the committee on that because the interesting point about that is the Royal Infirmary site to the, the south of Edinburgh. It was a PFI project. But uh, there's a new development taking place on that site now, which is actually going to be an NPD project, which is the replacement of the Royal Hospital for Sick Children's. And in fact, the uh, identified a, a, a successful bidder for that uh, NPD project is actually the company who has just completed the South Glasgow development, which is a, pu a traditional public sector model. So your point about companies expressing an interest in various types of models is very much a live issue, and that's a very good example of that. Yep. But we can give some a, a richness back to the committee out with this meeting in terms of just comparing yep. that to yeah, so Royal Infirmary Sick Children's yeah, example. Just to be clear what my question is, we have PPFI, PFI, PPP model versus the current model. Just give us one example where there's been a massive success one way or another, well, basically the new model. I take it we're not approaching this unless it is to, to save the public purse substantial sums of money. I mean, that, that's the that point I'm making. So yeah. if, there, if there's some proof of that, I think it would be good evidence for the committee to build on. Just a, a very quick uh, supplementary point on that, convener. Just to reassure the committee, we're not being complacent around existing PFI projects. We are looking where possible if, if refinancing of the project is an option. And we're also looking to get efficiency gain out of the, the, the current contractual position. So the Royal Infirmary has been refinanced, and uh, through uh, working with Scottish Futures Trust, we're looking at delivering efficiencies from the existing PFI projects. Well, can I just clarify that? Has there been, in terms of these projects that you've referred to there, has there been additional uh, contracts attached to these current contracts? So have we signed an addition to a current PFI PPP contract? We haven't signed an addition, but for example, if you take the two major PFI projects in Lanarkshire, here Myers and Wishall, we have just a uh, sort of an extension would be the best. We just extended you. the uh, FM services there, and part of that extension was a reduction in cost, which was several hundred thousand pounds, plus an extension in the range of services that were being provided within that contract. Okay, so there I'm has happy been, so there has been signed extensions to current PFI or PP contract. I, mean, I know of one in my own constituency, so I can speak for that some time ago. The Lanarkshire example I'm giving was a, a, a seven-year review as part of the contract of the soft FM services. So it wasn't an extension. The, 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 the tenure of the contract is still the same, but this was an opportunity to look at the delivering the increased value for money from the soft FM services, but happy to provide further detail. Okay. Can I thank the witnesses for the, sorry, a very brief supplementary from Colin Keown. Yeah, sorry, it was, uh, thank you very much indeed for taking that convener. It was really just uh, heading back to the Royal Infirmary uh, new contract, if you like. Uh, how, what's the anticipated savings on the, the old PFI uh, contract, simply because I know it's coming for se some serious criticisms over the years? The refinancing, which uh, took place uh, eight years ago now, that uh, released uh, £31 million back into the public purse over the duration of the contract. That was the savings that were realised from, from that particular okay. angle. Okay. I think this is for our time, and hopefully we can follow up and uh, yeah, look forward to following up in the correspondence exchange that we've committed to. Thank you. Yeah, just have a very brief five-minute uh, Interval.
Dollars, can I reconvene to agenda item number three, uh, which will take evidence from the Auditor General on AGS report entitled Scotland's Colleges 2015. Uh, I'd like to welcome Callan Gardner, uh, the Auditor General for Scotland, uh, Fraser McKinley, uh, Director of Performance Audit and Best Value, uh, Susan Lovett, Audit Manager, and Martin McLaughlin, uh, the Senior Auditor of Audit Scotland. Uh, I understand the Auditor General has a brief opening statement. Thank you, convener. Um, Scotland's colleges, as you know, are the main providers of further education and have an important role in helping to achieve sustainable economic growth. Colleges have gone through significant reforms over the last few years, and my report comments on these various reforms and how well they've been managed and delivered. It also provides an update on the financial position of the college sector. Our overall message is that colleges have coped well with the significant demands placed on them as they've managed this complex programme of reform. However, many of the changes are still taking place and colleges will need to continue to manage them carefully. We also identified gaps in how the Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council are monitoring and reporting progress with the reforms. The reform programme reduced the number of incorporated colleges from 37 to 20 since 2011-12. Planning for college mergers was generally good, and all of the merged colleges were established on time. The mergers have contributed to efficiency savings, but the Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council have not specified how they will measure some of the expected wider benefits of the reforms, and they have not gathered reliable information on the overall costs of mergers. The Office of National Statistics reclassified colleges as public bodies in 2010. This took effect from the 1st of April 2014 and has led to greater accountability for the use of public money, with colleges now required to submit more regular reports to the Scottish Funding Council on their finances and to seek approval for some items of expenditure. It's also led to the formation of arms-length foundations intended to protect colleges' financial reserves, and colleges transferred £99 million to these independent foundations in 2013-14. We found that changes to the college sector so far have had minimal negative impact on students in those colleges. The colleges continue to meet their targets for learning and delivered around 76 million hours of learning in 2013-14. And Education Scotland has not identified any significant issues with the quality of learning and teaching in the merged colleges it has reviewed to date. However, since aspects of the changes are still underway, it will be important for colleges, the government and the funding council to continue to monitor learning and teaching quality together with learning provision and student satisfaction. The number of individual students attending college decreased by around 7% between 2011-12 and 2013-14. The government continues to prioritise younger students and has reduced funding for short courses and for courses that do not lead to a recognised qualification. As a result, there's been a reduction of 48% in the number of part-time students and a reduction of 41% in the number of students aged 25 or older since 2008-9. Moving on to colleges' finances, these continue to be generally sound. Adjusting for the transfers to arms-length foundations, colleges reported a small overall surplus of £3.8 million in 2013-14. Scottish Government funding fell by 12.3% in real terms between 2011-12 and 2013-14, and college spending also reduced uh, over the same period, mainly through reductions in recurring staff costs. Most of the staff reductions were delivered through voluntary severance, and while most severance was managed in line with good practice, auditors did find significant weaknesses in how two colleges managed and approved senior staff severance arrangements and shortcomings in a further four. My report also draws attention to colleges' relatively short-term financial planning. While recent changes have made it more challenging for colleges to prepare longer-term plans, it's increasingly important that they now do so to ensure they effectively consider, plan for and meet the needs of their regions. We make a number of recommendations in the report for Scottish Government, for the Funding Council, regional bodies, colleges um, and their boards. In particular, the Scottish Government and the Funding Council should specify how they will measure and publicly report progress in delivering all of the benefits expected from the reform programme. It's also important that the Scottish Government and the Funding Council work with colleges to implement planned improvements in how severance is managed in future. 
Given the scale of change in the FE sector and the complexity of the new arrangements, we will continue to monitor colleges through the annual audit process and report back to this committee on the regular cycle. Convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions from the committee as always. Thank you. Uh, I'm open to questions and uh, ask Colin Beattie to come in the first question. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm pleased at the comments in the report that uh, despite the magnitude of the changes, that uh, the colleges met their targets for, for learning and that there's no significant uh, effect on pupils. That really is good. I have a wee bit of a concern uh, on page 23, starting with paragraph 44. It's about the transfer of the 99 million to arm's length foundations, and I know we've talked about this before. Um, one has to assume that part of that money, at least, is public funds that are going to third parties. And however, their constitutions are, bind them to a certain purpose, there are no guarantees. Now, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a fundamental principle about following the public pound. How do we do that in this case? Can we? What, can, what, what has to change to enable that to happen? Right, Mr Beattie, this is a complex issue that we have discussed before with the committee. Um, the reserves that colleges had built up over time do come from a combination of sources, including significant public funds, as well as income from other commercial activities that they undertake. Um, and the reclassification of colleges as public bodies meant that a solution needed to be found for how those reserves could be carried forward and not reduce the overall spending available to the government under the Scottish bloc. I'll ask Fraser to pick up some of the questions about the impact and about the future oversight of that money, if I may. Yeah, th thank you, Auditor General. Um, as, as the committee knows, we've been looking at arm's length external organisations for a good long number of years now, not so much in the college sector, but in particular local government. We've had the conversation with you, we've had conversations with the local government committee. So um, the, the arm's length foundations are effectively one of those. And um, the following the public pound thing is absolutely key, Mr Beattie. I think what we can do in this case on behalf of the Auditor General and local government's case on behalf of the Accounts Commission is ensure that the controls are in place to make sure that the, the flow of money between the two organisations is well controlled. Um, we uh, audit obviously in this case the colleges so we'll be able to keep track of what money they are uh, taking out of the arm's length foundations and what that's being used for and the controls around that. Um, uh, it's kind of early days but anecdotally we know that there have been uh, a couple of instances we had a meeting with the um, FE sector um, auditors only last week um, and there is some evidence coming through of the arm's length foundations uh, providing money to organisations that aren't colleges um, but they are schools so we don't have any evidence yet of uh, uh, that we've picked up of money for example going outside the education sector and I think that's where the articles of association are really important they're actually quite tightly defined about what they can use the funding for um, but rest assured that we will uh, as these things develop and mature, we'll be keeping a very close eye on it. Just finally, very briefly, Convener, there is an interesting tension in the system here between, I think, our interest and your interest in ensuring that that public money is well spent and well monitored and controlled, with recognising the fact that these arm's length foundations are independent charities with independent trustees and therefore need to operate independently and regulated by the Office for the Scottish Charity Regulator, whose interest is ensuring that the, the ALFs, to call them that, um, are uh, are operating independently of colleges and anyone else. So there is an interesting tension in the system there um, that we have uh, that we have experience of working through in the council sector in particular, and we'll continue to keep a very close eye on it. Are you satisfied that uh, the measures you're taking in terms of auditing the flow of this money will satisfactorily uh, ensure you capture all the transactions and that you will be able to uh, follow the public pound? Uh, yes, I am satisfied of that. That's not to say that we can absolutely give you a cast iron guarantee 100% of the time that it will always be perfect, because that's not what we do as auditors, but we are very alert to this uh, very new development in this landscape um, that we are, as I say, auditors will be keeping a very close eye on this year. Okay. In paragraph 7, there's mention that four colleges fell short of good practice in terms of their severance payments. How serious was that? 
The reference, I think, takes us back to pages 38 and 39, um, where we're talking in more detail about the severance arrangements that um, took place. Um, I think our finding overall was that two of the colleges had some quite significant shortcomings, and indeed there's another Section 22 report um, waiting to be laid in Parliament that I would expect to brief this committee on um, relatively soon. Um, the other... Uh, instances that auditors identified were less serious but still fell short of good practice. Um, again, as with your previous question about arms link foundations, this is clearly an issue that we've talked about a number of times with this committee in the college sector and in other settings. Um, and it is disappointing that um, an issue that's of such significant public concern is still causing problems. Um, the bright um, point in the uh, the report I'm able to bring to you today is that the Funding Council have now worked hard to strengthen their guidance and the oversight of this. Um, so we hope that these are the tale um, of poor practice in the past. But I share the committee's concern about these instances. The particular issue leads back into paragraph 21. The SFC provided £52 million 2011-12 and 2013-14 to support the mergers and another £6 million 2014-15 and the indication seems to be most of that went in severance. Was it well spent? Has, it, has the, has the uh, benefits of that been properly measured? Uh, basically, it seems an awful lot of money to provide to pay people off. I'll ask colleagues to come in in a moment with more detail. And perhaps about I can ask one other question on the sure. back of that. How many of these people that were given severance payments were senior staff and principals and so forth in the colleges? I'll ask colleagues to come in with a bit more detail in a moment. I think it's worth saying initially that because one of the objectives of the reform programme was to generate efficiency savings by cutting out duplication, we weren't at all surprised to see that there were significant numbers of uh, severance packages agreed and um, that there was money required to support that. Um, it's one of the... Um, uh, examples we've seen right across the public sector in responding to reducing finances. One of the key ways of doing that is to make short-term payments that release you from long-term employment obligations. So we're not surprised by that. And it's clearly very important that that public money is spent properly, um, that it's well governed and that there's transparency in um, the way that it's managed and the payments that are made. Um, I'll ask colleagues to pick up a bit more about the detail of the split between senior and more junior staff and the things that we've seen working well and less well. Who wants to come in? Susan? Do we have that team? <coughs> Um, we don't currently have the numbers of senior staff in front of us. I'm sure we'd we'll be able to provide something. Um, we've received some information from the local auditors um, and obviously from the audited accounts. I think, as the Auditor General pointed out, due to the duplication within the sector, if you're going through a merger process and the fact that around 60% of college expenditure is on staffing, then in order to make long-term savings and recurring savings, then that's the most obvious way to do it which is why it was financed that way. Is it... Sorry, somewhere else. So I was, is, I was just going to say we will come back with more detail on this, on your specific point about the principals and the senior uh, members of staff, Mr. BT. Yeah. That's good, because what, one, of, one, of the, one of the points that's come out already is that the SFC doesn't really have any powers to enforce the good practice of severance and severance payments and everything that's around that. All they can do is recover funds from the, or penalise the college by recovering funds from them, which of course penalises the students, not the people who benefited from whatever uh, whatever uh, process was in fact misused. Um, very closely as part of this report because of the concerns that have been aired and, and raised by the committee before. Um, I think the Scottish Funding Can Council's revised guidance is now clearer um, about what's required um, and links back to our own guidance on managing severance well. But you're absolutely right, unless there's illegality concerned, and in most cases there isn't, um, the uh, sanctions that are available are limited. 
think it's made more complicated in the case of this reform program um, because the colleges that made the arrangements in most instances no longer exist as legal entities. They've been merged into new organisations with new leadership who have a formal accountability but weren't part of the decision-making process. Um, and the um, penalties that can be levied, as you absolutely rightly say, would penalise the uh, new colleges and the students who rely on them for learning support. I think it's fair to say the Funding Council recognise those difficulties, but for us that highlights all the more importantly uh, the premium that should be placed on making sure the guidance is absolutely clear and that the oversight of that part of any merger process is done properly in real time rather than audit coming along afterwards and identifying through the audit process where things have gone wrong. A brief supplementary. Yes, no, it's a point of clarification. So, in terms of the the Scottish Colleges Foundation uh, and the, and Alios, are, are they actually set up in a in a, in a similar manner? Uh, so just uh, obviously, as Fraser McKinley was aware of, so previous on the local government committee, and, and you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the issue of the Alios. Alios as well. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, arms length external organisations. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, don't, we don't need to say that again, it's just for clarity. Okay. And then we can Thank you. Um, uh, the, the, the Arms Length Foundations, my understanding, is are all, are all charitable organisations. So in that sense, it's a bit different to the council local government sector, where al ALIOs um, are a whole different range of different kinds of organisations. Um, as we say in, in the section on page uh, 23, the, the Arms Length Foundations in the college sector are charitable organisations uh, and as you say there is a, a, an umbrella one a national one set up but also there are there are several that have been set up locally and regionally so in that sense they are very similar um, and our understanding is that the articles of association are similar in that they are quite you know tightly defined about what those what that money uh, should be used for okay thank you well, <coughs> really on the same point and um You'll understand it. This, you know that this committee asked a lot of questions on Arms Link Foundation, and particularly the previous convener. Um, and, uh, and so I felt in the past that I was quite assured about, um, you know, what was happening. I was assured about the Arms Length Foundations, etc., and I was felt I had an assurance about the Articles of Association. But when I read this report, particularly paragraph 47, I really began to. Uh, get quite concerned about this and um, my concerns would be there is no guarantee that these funds will be returned to the college sector as this would raise concerns about the independence of the foundations and other organisations such as schools which has been mentioned, voluntary sector organisations or private sector educational providers can also apply for funding held by these foundations. Now, if we just think at the moment about the, the Wood Commission developing Scotland's young workforce, um, you know, some of the modern apprenticeships may be done through colleges, may be done through the school sector, but there's nothing to stop uh, voluntary sector or private sector providers to say, we'll train X number uh, of apprentices every year, which is fine, and, you know, if the uh, alios decide to give them money to do that, then... In my opinion, the main thing is that people are being trained. But the point here is that we actually lose sight of the trail of the public pound because when it goes out to a voluntary sector organisation or a private provider, then really after that, it's none of our business. So the point that Colin Beatty was making about the audit of the public pound, it would appear to me that once it's been allocated to voluntary or private we don't have an audit. Am I correct? For the, for the sums that are transferred to the Arms Length Foundations, the money um, can only be used in accordance with the, the articles, the objectives of those arms, arms Length Foundations. Now, I don't audit the foundations. They're audited um, by auditors appointed under the framework set up by the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, um, and they're regulated by the regulator in the same way. You're right, there is less transparency about it. What we can look at is the money that's transferred into the um, fund funds by the colleges and the money that's transferred back to the colleges by the trustees. One of the OSCAR requirements, the charity regulator's requirements, is that the trustees are independent of anybody who might benefit from it. And, and that is, is 
just one of the, the corollaries that are there. As we've discussed in the past, it does have implications for that transparency, um, and it's something that we are aware of in sectors other than further education. Um, I'm not sure there's an answer to it. It's, it's a, an unavoidable consequence of them being foundations. And that you can audit flows yeah. between the college and the alios both mm -hmm. ways. But it was just in your response to Colin Beatty mm -hmm. that you will always have an audit of that public pound. The truth is that when it goes from the alio mm -hmm. to organisations other than even schools, uh, you're, voluntary you're, sector yeah. and private providers, there is no longer an audit of that public pound. Is that correct? You're absolutely right. They're yeah. audited outside the usual public sector That's framework right. and there is less transparency back to this committee. Yeah, OK. Um, and, and my second question was really, um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm uh, concerned about measuring the expected wider benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, I think every parliamentarian here voted uh, and supported the college mergers. We thought, thought it was a good idea. You have said that um, there have been some savings. Um, but you mentioned uh, the, the funding uh, reduction of 12%. But in your previous report, I think it was two years ago, there was a funding cut of 24%. So we have a 12% on top of a 24% cut. Um, which is very serious. You also mentioned, um, uh, well, sorry, what you didn't mention was the actual number of students. In a previous report, you mentioned 140,000 fewer students. We don't have an update in how many more student places have been cut, although we do have a reduction of 48% in part-time and 41% over 25 so my question is that in terms of the outcomes that were brought in in the college mergers, one of the outcomes was to widen access to people from more deprived backgrounds and, uh, you know, to address the inequalities gap. So do you have any concerns that uh, it seems that if you're over 25 or if you have other commitments, family or something, and you want to do a part-time course... It's actually more difficult, and these may be the most needy in terms of uh, getting training and uh, further education. Uh, would you say it's become more difficult to get into further education for over 25 and part-time students, uh, and it will be more difficult to achieve that outcome? There's an awful lot in that question. I'll have a first bash and colleagues may want to add some detail. Um, first of all, um, you're, you're right about the direction of government policy for FE colleges. Um, it's clearly appropriate for any government to set its priorities and this government has, has um, decided to focus on learners aged 16 to 25 and on courses that lead to a recognised qualification. That has led to a reduction in the number of students who are over 25 um, and to the number of um, part-time students. And in, in relation to the first couple of elements of your question, you might be interested in Exhibit 5, which shows um, the trend in the makeup of students attending Scotland's colleges over the last seven years, um, broken down between full-time students and part-time students. And there is a marked drop in part-time students there um, in line with that policy. In relation to overall fund... thousand uh -huh. that's only in part-time. Yes. And I really wanted an update because we use a figure in the Parliament of 130 to 140,000, but I saw that one, and it's 150,000 in part-time students alone. Uh, but it was really the over 25s as well, because they've had a 41% cut. I'll ask colleagues if we can lay our fingers on the number of students but broken down by age now. If not, we can certainly let you have it separately. Um, exhibit 7 shows the, the trend in funding over a longer period, um, the uh, eight-year period going back to 2008-9. Um, and as you say, we reported previously a significant drop between 10-11 and 11-12 when the overall financial reductions came through. Um, I think our bigger point, though, is that um, the reform programme was uh, the government's stated response to both its policy objectives and the fact that funding remains tight 
site for public services. And while it's clear that the mergers have made a contribution to efficiency savings, we don't think the government has set out clearly enough how it will measure um, the expected benefits of merger in line with our mergers report going back a number of years now. Um, and for some areas, we think there isn't good baseline information available. And that's clearly very important for this committee and for the parliament as a whole in um, being able to be satisfied that the objectives of reform are being delivered and that there aren't unintended consequences for other student groups. Just very briefly, on, in paragraph 54, Mrs Scanlon, we, we talk about the actual number of people in terms of headcount, which uh, might help a little bit. So in 2013-14, we say that about 238,000 people attended college, which is just under 20,000 fewer than 11-12, uh, and that's 36% lower than 2008-09. So that, that's trying to give you the overall, in terms of number of actual people, uh, attending colleges and then the rest of, as Caroline says, the, the exhibit and the paragraphs following that tried to break it down by, by age group a little bit. Point is uh, sort of included in the report, but uh, I'm not sure if this is totally appropriate, convener. I'm sure you'll tell me, but it has been covered in this week's Times Educational Supplement and in the local media, and it's a concern I have raised before, and it is the cost of the regional boards. And uh, I think you'll know there's been quite a bit said recently about the Glasgow Regional Board, but um, I'm, I'm, my concern is mainly the money allocated to the Further Education UHI Regional Board in terms of taking that money from frontline education in the colleges. But I, I just wonder, um, convener, if uh, the Auditor General would uh, wish to give us an update or if I can perhaps ask, generally speaking, if you have any concerns about the governance of the regional boards and the cost of the regional boards, because I am aware that does take money from frontline chalk face, if you like. I think in the report on page 20, we say very clearly we think the new governance arrangements are complex. It's, it's too early, in my view, for us to be able to say whether they're working, whether the, the, they're having the intended benefits, and whether the concerns that have been expressed by some colleges and, and by others about the clarity of roles have got substance or not. Um, we will audit the regional um, arrangements as, as part of the audit of FE in future. Um, the, the Glasgow College's regional board isn't required, hasn't yet been required to produce a full set of accounts that we have audited, but that will be our way in. It will do so. We will audit them. And clearly we will be looking right across um, Scotland at the way in which these new arrangements are working as part of the wider scope of audit that we do. Um, so I think all I can say is to give you the assurance we recognise some of the tensions in there and we will be looking at that as part of our audit work and we'll report it back to this committee if that seems appropriate ask for a time scale on that. Uh, will that be done this year? Um, it will be done on the back of the latest set of audited accounts. I'm afraid I've lost track of what the, that actually means now. There have been so many changes to them. Yeah. Um, but it will be within the next 12 months to, to keep you. the cycle going. Yes. So. Thank you. You're not surprised. Um, uh, Auditor General, I think you said in your opening remarks that there was no, if I caught your quote correctly, there was no reliable information on the cost of mergers. Is that so? We don't think there's good enough reliable, good enough information on the cost of mergers. The government knows, um, and the funding council know, what were made available to colleges for central funding, and that's set out in the report. Mm. There will have been other costs that weren't um, captured well enough, and equally, the baseline for some of the changes um, is not available in the way we'd expect it to be. Uh, and, and why is? I mean, when are we going to have that information, or are we ever going to have that information? Um, the is it auditable, I suppose, should be the, would, be, would be the better question? It's a good question. Um, the Funding Council plans continuing evaluations, as we say in here, and they um, expect that some of the information that we've been looking for will come through that process. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, welcome, and we'll look to see how well it works. We're also very conscious, though, from a range of work we've done, that in some cases it can be quite hard to go back and put in place information if it wasn't collected at the time. Mm -hmm. A number of other things do change, including the broader funding allocations, um, changes that would have happened in any case, and it can be quite hard to go back and sort of set the counterfactual of what the number might have been had everything else not changed. But the quid pro quo of that, of course, is that an assertion was made about savings to be made, and, and it can't be proved. 
at this stage, the, the Funding Council and the Government weren't able to get, give us the information that we asked for to demonstrate the costs of the merger process. And I'll ask the Mary Scanner's question, do we have any notion of when we might, when the committee might be uh, allowed to understand what those, what those numbers might be? I'll ask Susan to talk you through more what the plans are for evaluation and hmm. what we think we will have and what our concerns are. Susan. Yes, um, the Scottish Funding Council, as part of the merger process, um, agreed to undertake two post-merger evaluations for each merger college, one at six months and one at two years post-merger. Um, and as part of the, the fuller assessment, the two-year post-merger evaluation, they will be focusing um, quite clearly on the costs and efficiency savings that have been identified by these specific colleges. So at this point, um, we don't have that detailed information, but the Funding Council um, have highlighted that that's a specific um, theme that they will be addressing as part of the, the two-year evaluation. I'm sure that's true. Um, your, no, your report also says the Scottish Government identified that mergers would deliver £50 million of efficiency savings each year from 15-16. Where's the evidence for that? At this stage, we don't have it. And that's why we've made the recommendation we have on page yeah. six of the report that the Scottish Government should be publishing this information. Um, it strikes me like police. I mean, they make an assertion about how much is going to be saved and then... Uh, you know, here you are, the Auditor General, telling us what you found, and you haven't been able to find that assertion to be correct. We we don't have the information at this stage. Susan's outlined to you what we're told are the plans for collecting it. Um, but as you know, this goes way back to our original report on managing mergers, where uh, we recommended at that stage that clarity about the expected costs and benefits was very important to underpin the rationale for making these changes. It would be fair to assume, as a parliamentarian, that when a government say they're going to make £50 million of saving, they've got a pretty decent reason to come up with that figure. Otherwise, it might have been 30 or 20 or 140. They made, they made a, a, a clear, as you, report, you say in your report, a, a clear statement about £50 million. So have you found any evidence in your audit of the government as to how they came up, came up with that figure of £50 million? What we have looked for is um, evidence of the amount of savings that have been generated by the process, and we haven't been we haven't found that. I think it is a question for government rather than for us. I apologise. I'm yeah. sure that's entirely true. Just on paragraph 29, which is this whole area that you've been very fairly describing, um, you in that paragraph it describes a change in the oh, I don't know if you'd call it the target or the scale of savings expected. Um, the, there's a couple of sentences there which says uh, um, this letter was superseded by revised guidance in March 2013. Were you able to understand why the government changed its guidance, which must have been difficult genuinely for everyone involved? Our understanding is that it was um, to prevent unintended consequences to individual colleges um, being asked to make very significant savings. Um, it wasn't about the overall quantum, it was about the spread of those across colleges. But again, it's something you may want to explore with government. Did you discover as to when that guidance changed that made a material difference to the potential uh, savings that could be accrued by the whole merger process? No, it didn't. No, we, they remained with the figure of an expected 50 million savings through the merger process. It would be a reasonable question to prosecute. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, convener, um, I, I think it was... Colin Beatty that, that started on this year, but could I take you back to the, your conclusion that the changes to date have made uh, no significant detriment, uh, have had no significant detrim detrimental effect on students? Could you just talk us through how you came to that conclusion? What was, what were the, what did you look at that, that allowed you to arrive at that? I'll ask Susan to come in in a moment. Um, it's clearly important to put it in context that um, these are pro uh, changes that are still very much underway, and particularly curriculum reviews are still. Um, in, in process um, and we know that the focus can only be on the students who are in further education not the students who haven't been able to access it because of changing priorities but Susan can talk you through the material in the paragraphs from 48 onwards around the evidence that's available and why we drew that conclusion. Um, as part of um, our audit field work, we requested from the field work colleges um, information, so surveys that they had done with uh, students to identify any issues arising through the merger process. Uh, the Scottish Funding Council had carried out all of their six-month post-merger evaluations, and as part of that process, they met with a range of students um, to gather views. We also reviewed the reports from Education Scotland, and again, they would um, be involved with discussing with students um, their 
um, expectations and experience of the merger process. And gathering all of that information together and analysing all of that, um, we reached the conclusion that there had been um, no significant detrimental effects on students. And certainly, as part of our discussions with the merger colleges, um, significant emphasis was placed on maintaining business as usual for students um, and that was their ultimate priority was to minimise any negative effect and ensure that um, learning provision was maintained throughout the process of the merger. Um, because uh, I think that's helpful because you, you've presumably seen the comments that, that Larry Flanagan from EIS made in, in uh, response to this report um, you know where he, he says that that conclusion is simply wrong. Um, is is it fair to say, in terms of finding some common ground between your uh, audit Scotland and EIS, that I think actually what I take from, from uh, what, you, what you're saying there is that, that your assessment was very much about current students at, at college and uh, that a, a, a lot of this debate and commentary around what has actually happened in our colleges actually relates to the figures that Mary Scanlon was asking about, which is the, the thousands of kids who are, who are not at college in places that are not available and courses that are no longer taught as a result of these changes, and you don't make any comment in your report about that impact. Is that correct? I think that may be part of the, the difference that's been expressed, and I'll ask Fraser to say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, as Susan's outlined, what we have done for the four merger colleges that we looked at in detail is to look at all of the evidence that is available from their own surveys, from SFC work, from the um, Education Scotland inspections that have taken place. And all of that evidence tells us for the students who are consulted, there's been no detriment, um, and that has been an objective of the colleges themselves to maintain. We know that there are students who, because of the um, priorities, the policy priorities that are in place um, are not in education in colleges when they previously might have been. We haven't looked at their views at this stage, but there is a, a bigger question there. Um, and there is also the important caveat that uh, significant things like the curriculum reviews may lead to changes in future about what teaching takes place and where it's delivered. It's too soon to know what that might look like or what the effect would be. Fraser, is there anything you want to add to that? Just very briefly in terms of the work, uh, we are reviewing how we go about this report and indeed there are other overview reports. We do ones on the NHS and uh, for the Auditor General and uh, Local Government and the Accounts Commission. So in a sense, it, it is by definition an overview report of the sector. I think given the very substantial kind of issues that are raised in this report, we are looking at what else we might do in a bit more detail in the next period. Um, as part of that exercise, we would of course be delighted to speak to the EIS and other unions as we do in other more specific work. They were very closely involved in our education report that we did um, last year, for example. So we had seen the comments and were more than happy to engage with EIS and others as we as we take this report forward and think about what issues we might want to take a closer look at in the future. I mean, clearly, clearly there are things in some of the, the comments that EIS have made uh, which support um, the conclusions in, in this report, and there are areas uh, uh, of common ground between their conclusions about what's happening in the sector and your own conclusions based on this report. But do you think, you know, given this was an overview of the sector, that you perhaps could have done more to engage with them in terms of the production of this report? Yeah, I, absolutely happy to reflect on that, for sure. Um, I think, um, as I say, it's a, we, because of the nature of this, we... Um, we, we have tended to use the evidence that is generated by others, if you know what I mean. So our starting point is yeah. what evidence is there from colleges and from Education Scotland and others. Um, but as I say, very happy to reflect on how we do that in future, for sure. Well, that just takes me to a, a final point then, then uh, convener, because I suppose at the heart of some of the, the, beyond the, the criticisms about uh, what's happened in terms of students who are no longer in, in colleges, but the, the criticism they make is that uh, the, the report is is driven from a management perspective, which is borne out slightly by the fact that the information that you are basing your conclusions on is provided as a result of the, the administration and management of the, the, um, of the college system. And I suppose it goes back as well to the earlier point about redundancies. I, I think you said you'd give us a bit more information about who has left the sector. Um, do, do you have a view about what, the, what balance you would expect to see? Uh, because clearly EIS is a professional body and the trade union would be concerned uh, with with, with headcount uh, in terms of it, its members, that's understandable. Um, would you have expected to see uh, the balance that that, you, that is there in terms of senior managers leaving um, colleges as a result of mergers? I mean, that presumably, you know, that was at the heart of the argument that senior people would be where we would be duplicating, and uh, you know, and people in, in lecture rooms and classrooms and, and workshops teaching uh, isn't duplication. That's the purpose of the of the service. So, it is what we are seeing 
what should be happening, or do you have the information there, or is that something that can be provided to me? We come back to the other point. Um, I think just a couple of observations. First of all, you're right, we've used um, evidence from a range of sources, um, but I wouldn't want the committee to be under any illusion that we're not professionally sceptical about that evidence. It's our job to look at all the evidence we receive, um, look at what confirms it, but also what might counter it, and make sure the picture as a whole is consistent, and if it's not, to go and look for more evidence. So we're not uncritical of what is provided to us by colleges, by the funding council, by government, in any circumstances. On the question of who we might expect to be leaving the college sector as a result of the reforms, um, you're right, we would expect there to be a reduction, first of all, in the management teams, because um, if you have three colleges merging, you don't need three principals and three times as many assistant principals as you might have had. That's why I think some of the focus that we've seen where it's not been managed well is very much at that level of the most senior people. Um, but equally, as the process of merger um, goes through as it continues and uh, the new colleges and their boards are looking at what learning is required in their local region, how it can best be delivered to meet the needs of employers and learners, you would expect to see some changes quite unevenly distributed um, among both the teaching staff and the support staff of the colleges um, and it's that picture that we haven't been able to give you in detail today, uh, we'll have a look at what's available and come back, but I would expect for, for people other than the management teams it to be quite variable and it should be proper properly based on an assessment of the needs and, and what has been inherited by the new colleges. Fraser. If, if I can convene mm. briefly, there is, there is a, bit, a bit of detail we can help a little bit, I think, on Exhibit 12, page 37, where we've... Um, now, what, what this um, doesn't say specifically, Mr Smith, is who's gone in voluntary redundancy schemes or voluntary, voluntary severance schemes, but it does give you some picture of the shift in, in staffing across groups, which um, shows that the teaching staff reduction variance as a percentage is about nine percent the biggest chunks actually are what are around other support services and other income generating activity um so so there's a there is a mix i think it's difficult for us to say whether that's the right mix or the wrong mix um and obviously within each of those groups there will be lots of very interested parties and um, not least the, the trade unions of the different groups of staff and um, which will be concerned about that i think a big part of our job going forward is to continue to monitor the impact of all of this. This is all pretty new. And while, as Caroline says, we're, we're not um, seeing, we're not seeing lots of um, very strong evidence of detriment, we will, we will, of course, be keeping a close eye on that as, as the merger process is bed down. So as a result of this whole process, is the management uh, of Scotland's colleges a flatter structure than it was before we started? Can you, can you say that based on what um, you've looked at? And is the proportion of the amount of the budget spent on managing our colleges as opposed to teaching people in our colleges, uh, has that decreased? There are fewer managers in Scotland's colleges because people are still working through the process of looking at their staffing structures. We don't know whether they're flatter across the piece yet. Um, and I think, um, as Susan has said, the focus has been on continuing to deliver uh, teaching to learners during the early stages. Um, it's something we will be keeping under review as we um, continue our work in this sector. And we can certainly bear that interest of yours in mind in pulling it together for the next stage. At this stage, though, it is still in process, as we say very clearly in the report, um, and I think we're not in a settled state around what the management structures look like or the proportion spent on senior staff relative to teaching staff. Thank you. Can I just follow on from the yeah. comment about no detrimental effect on yeah. uh, students? That I mean, I suppose it is a pretty significant statement to make. Uh, you know, I mean, it's I mean, I mean, the whole basis of this is to improve the student experience. I'm thinking for those who are on part-time courses, who are no longer on part-time courses because of the emphasis, that they wouldn't have been consulted on this. Uh, so I suppose if you're out of the system and somebody says, well, listen, we were at the college last week and we carried out a survey, then I suppose that misses quite a significant body of people who were, should have been around in the college who, maybe if they were consulted before they left, would have said, well, you know, this has had a significant impact on me. So it's pretty, I mean, I, I suppose this statement is pretty significant to say that, given that there's a body of people who are missing from the, the process. And, and to be fair as well, I understand the ways in which we go about assessing this, but it's probably not the most objective way to go about collating opinion to ask the government body who have a significant role in this do you think this has been pretty good? So, 
you know, how do we, you know, is there not something here to be said for a more objective approach to this? I think there are two different questions there, Convener. The question that we've looked at is for the students who are being served by Scotland's colleges, how has their experience been affected by the reform programme? Um, and we haven't just asked the colleges if they think it's had an impact. We've looked at the student um, satisfaction surveys they've done. We've looked at the SFC evaluations. We've looked at the inspections carried out by Education Scotland and pulled all of that together to make a careful conclusion, which we say in here is that to date, there's no evidence that there's been a detriment to students' experience. Now, that is, that's not as positive as saying it's improved and we'll be looking for that in future. It's also not saying there hasn't been a detriment. We're saying that there's no evidence of that. But you're right, there is a bigger question about... Should we, though, should we not have said, wait a minute, there's all these students who are now no longer in the campus who have been affected by the decision of the merger. So, you know, I mean, no. and, and I'm sure it must have, I mean, in terms of the team that have carried out this work, somebody should have said, I mean, I can look at it and say straight away, and I'm not kind of audit, mm -hmm. but I'm sure most of it is because I said... Why not ask these students who've been affected by this? And actually, it could have been that these students, and I'm just been been fair here, may have said, "Well, actually, that allowed me then to move on to a, a full-time course that was available, or it might not have." But it, they're not part of this process, so how can we be you so significantly uh, you know, moving in the direction of this is really not had any detrimental effect? I mean, is that? I know I take on board point you're making, but it's still a strong statement here saying. Is there no detrimental effect on students? I agree with you. That's a, a separate question and an important one. We've looked at the students who are still being served by colleges, and that's the conclusion we've come to. But I think it's an entirely appropriate question to ask. What about the students who may have been in part-time um, further education before, or older students who may have had access to courses? I think that's uh, something which the government... You're actually probably pretty happy about it because you're still there. It's the ones who are not there. I genuinely think on. there are two separate questions. I think for the students who are there, it is quite possible that there could have been a negative impact on their experience from um, the all of the things that are involved in reform, from uh, college management having their eye off the ball to disgruntled staff, all of the things that could have affected them. And we're saying from the evidence we've got, there's no evidence that's happened. Equally, I entirely agree there's a separate question saying how are the people who might have been in further education previously who would have been part-time students or older students and who, because of the government's policies, are not, how are they affected? I don't think that's something that we can look at as auditors, though. I think it's something that uh, you might want to explore with the government and with the funding council to see what they know about the impact of that policy decision and how else those, those people might have their particular learning needs met in the context of the Wood, Wood Review and the focus on younger people's skills. Okay. Nigel Don. Thank you, Ruff. And, and good morning, Auditor General. Um, can I just take you to section 7981 about pensions? Um, clearly, there is a general issue about public sector pensions. There is the imponderability of future returns, and therefore actuaries will keep going on a cyclical basis, I suppose, uh, giving us different different numbers as to the values and, and how underfunded or overfunded we are. My question, uh, Auditor General, really here is just in the context in which this report is written of our colleges, is there anything significantly different between what you were looking at here for the colleges and the general problem of public sector pensions, which presumably we'll return to another day? I, I would say not. Colleges may, uh, colleagues may want to come in in a moment. Um, I think what we're seeing here is a significant um, pension liability which needs to be managed over the long term. Um, the staff tend to be members either of the teacher superannuation scheme or the local government pension scheme. One's unfunded, one's funded, so they throw up slightly different questions. But both have been through the process of negotiating changes um, over the last few years, which are intended uh, to make those liabilities more manageable, and we'll be looking at the effect that they have. I guess the difference is that colleges tend to be small bodies, so the impact on their balance sheet of changes um, from one year to another in the assumptions, in discount rates, in uh, life expectancies can look like particularly large numbers in this context. Um, but I don't think it's a different issue for colleges than it is for public bodies across the piece. Do colleagues want to add anything to that? No, thank you. No. Thank you. Can I just ask one final question? Uh, in the report, we mentioned that staff numbers have decreased across the estates, I think, over the last... Uh, three, four financial years uh, by nearly 
nearly 10%. And it says in the report that, that most of them have been met through voluntary termination, or voluntary severance arrangements. It says mainly, uh, are there a number of them that haven't been managed through voluntary severance arrangements? Martin may be able to, to add a bit of detail here, but in most mergers, we would expect to see people um, also taking the opportunities, for, for example, if somebody resigns to go to another job, they would not fill that post to help towards the process. Um, Martin, do you want to add something? To no, um, it's in, as it's just been outlined, there's natural wastage and there'll be people resigning, there'll be people retiring who perhaps won't be replaced. So that's why you can't say that 100% of it is due to voluntary severance. There will always be um, what you call natural turnover of staff. So is there been any Pulsary within that? As, as far as I'm aware, no. It's just government policy, not to. Okay, yeah. Just for clarity, it was just clarity on that paragraph. Okay, uh, I can thank the Auditor General for evidence and uh, over a short, very short briefing, a uh, short, short interval to allow for the next item. Move to agenda item number four, uh, which is a section 22 report, the 2013-14 audit of Scottish Government's consolidated accounts. Uh, now, obviously, this is an AGS report. Uh, I wonder if any comment, if any comments from colleagues, uh, Tavish Scott. Yeah, can I, thank you very much, Gavina. Can I just speak briefly to this? I've got three points I'd like to ask about. I mean, this is obviously an IT system in terms of the new common agricultural policy from this year onwards, designed to make payments to Scotland's farmers, crofters, and land users. And as the so the appendix from the Auditor General uh, says, there is significant the the uh, programme continues to carry significant risk up to full implementation and beyond. Well, that's certainly exactly what. Um, people trying to work with this program are finding. Um, as the report says, um, the business case costs have increased from £102.5 million to £178 million. Pounds. That's a 74% increase. And the IT company, because that's what I assume is the uh, paragraph 9 where it says the largest area of spend is on the IT delivery partner, I presume that's an IT company, the costs there have gone up from £28.8 million to £60.4 million, and a 111% increase. Now, by any standards, those are vast increases, and we have been here before on some IT projects. So I, I do believe, Kavina, we need to find out the reasons for that, including from the EU. I mean, it's very comfortable to blame the EU. Believe me, I've done it plenty of times in my life as well. So... Um, I would, I would hope, Convener, that we'd be wanting to ask a lot of questions of the Accountable Officer for this project and to the EU and to stakeholders who know an awful lot about what's going on here. The, actually, the most worrying paragraph for me is actually paragraph 11, because in that it says at the end that there, there has been less progress on key parts of the process, which in effect are those who have to use the process, use the IT system. Uh, and I think that's extremely worrying, and that's why we need to ask, uh, in my view stakeholders. This depends on effectively um, individual um, crofters and farmers having broadband because you need to do it online. You can also do it by paper and that's I welcome that fact but most of us are being encouraged to do who use it are being encouraged to do it online uh, and if you don't have broadband you just can't use it and there's a, an overlap there to uh, to uh, uh, pr reports that the Auditor General has brought before us on super fast broadband uh, as well. So there's some very significant issues here. Um, in a practical sense, this is a process that used to take an individual an hour. It's now taking at least three hours to do. So it's a massive implication for, for individuals. Uh, and I, I would hope that um, 
the committee would take this, uh, would, would agree to have a look at this very closely um, from an audit point of view, just because of the sheer increase in costs, but also from a, a human point of view, this is affecting people in their day-to-day -day lives, running businesses right across Scotland, in every part of Scotland, uh, and it is not going well, and I would ask that we would give that some consideration. Thank you. Mary Scanlon. Um, well, I was actually hoping that this update would be very positive. In fact, it's uh, in fact raising more concerns. And as Tavish Scott said, paragraph 16, the programme continues to carry significant risk. But uh, my concern would be paragraph 5. At this stage, there's 435 single application forms being submitted. That compares with 1,914 last year. So it seems to be that we are already significantly uh, behind. My second main or my main concern is uh, the EC requires payments to be made to farmers by June 2016, but in Scotland payments are normally made in the preceding December, in other words December this year, and this is the timetable the government is working to. However, if we go further down, uh, this government has been considering contingency plans uh, and then uh, that work has shown that the software package would be a viable short-term contingency but would not be capable of meeting the December target for payments. So I think, as Tavish Scott mentioned, there will be farmers and crofters across this country that will be very seriously concerned about uh, bank loans, cash flow issues, that the normal funding that they get in December, they may now expect that, if it's possible, in uh, June the following year. But I'm very concerned about uh, the impact on farm payments, and uh, I'm afraid the update hasn't brought the assurance that I had hoped for. And it seems when the Auditor General says there are significant risks I think that's something that uh, farmers and crofters across Scotland should be seriously worried about. Colm Beattie. Thank you, Convener. I think the thing I find most disturbing is that in a single meeting of this committee, we've got two issues here from the EU that are adding costs, a cost burden to, to this government and to the, and, and to the taxpayer. Um, because of the delays in this particular one, there's all these increased costs in the programme due to the need to deliver IT solution and compressed timescales, as highlighted here, and to these changes in EC requirements. And I'd like to know whether these EC requirements are now fully um, described and, 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 and we fully understand where we are in them because they've been so late and they come out in dribs and drabs. Are we there? Have we, have we, are we going to be faced with last-minute changes again, or are we actually in a position that we can say that we've, we've got a, a, a proper definition? Um, there's no doubt carry, it carries risks. I think the government's absolutely right to be targeting the December. I mean, it, it has to be. Um, and, you know, there are, there are concerns over this, and I think these, uh, these concerns need to be highlighted from this committee. I just clarify we've got two options. Uh, one uh, is to to note the update, which I don't think is what colleagues are keen to do. And the other option is to consider taking uh, oral evidence from the Scottish Government uh, on this. Is that the preferred, uh, preferred approach? I okay, so. very strongly agree, if I may, if you agree with Colin Beattie's point. Um, as Colin will also remember, the EU regularly qualifies their accounts in respect of agricultural payments. It would be quite nice to have the EU auditor in here to audit him, on the, him or her, I do apologise, uh, whoever, uh, on their performance as well. So I think Colin Beattie's point is very correct about so the EU as well. Are we asking for an EU representative? Well, I'll leave that to your good judgment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so we have two uh, witnesses, uh, firstly the Scottish Government, uh, witness and uh, someone from the EU, uh, an appropriate uh, representative from the EU, and we'll approach that. Is that agreed? Okay. Yeah. As colleagues. Uh, and as agreed, can we now move to item number five, which is uh, to move into private session? Thank you.